Okay. Thank you. All right. Well, I think we could get started. Um, we may have people trickling in. We had um, we had about 40 or 50 RSVPs, but um, it is uh, it is a holiday for some folks uh, that work in the public sector. Um, well, good morning. I think I've met most of you. My name is John Rennie. I'm the director of... Um, of CUES, the Center for Urban Environmental Solutions, and I'm, I'm excited to um, this, you know, have this event uh, with some folks who have been part of this uh, research center um, a number of years ago who are going to be speaking about um, the work that they did and the implications that that has for uh, the problems that we face today. Um, I, um, I, I've been reading a lot of the, I was reading a lot of the history of, of CUES, formerly known as the Joint Center, um, and the work that um, John DeGrove did. Uh, last night, in fact, I found a, a really great history on the Congress for the New Urbanism's uh, website. I think it's the, the local chapter. And it was talking about the, the uh, environmental challenges that, that were being posed back in the 70s and 80s and 90s. Uh, and, and, you know, from particularly from the rapid development that was occurring in Florida at the time. And, you know, it really kind of made me think that in terms of where we are here today, you know, in 2022, we are still posed by those rapid development uh, challenges facing our, um, you know, our, our economy, our environment, and our social fabric of, of, our, of our community of South Florida. Um, but, you know, in some ways, I think before COVID, it looked like to many that maybe South Florida was slowing down a little bit in terms of development. But certainly after or during COVID, uh, we are, I think, growing very, very rapidly now, uh, probably just as quickly as any time in, in, our, in our history over the last 50, 60 years. Um, of course, you know, we have a, a kind of a new threat, um, an existential threat of, of major hurricanes, which we saw last week with Hurricane Ian that struck the West Coast, and uh, you know, we, we barely missed it, and we were very fortunate and lucky. Uh, I lived through Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans, so I know firsthand what living in a post-disaster city is like. And um, you know, we, we uh, at some point uh, will not be so fortunate. There will be probably a major storm that will, that will impact us in our community here. And so what I'm hoping with this panel is to think about the, these multiple challenges that are facing our, our community with rapid development, traffic, unaffordable housing, uh, and some of the bigger threats about sea level rise and uh, climate change and, and massive storms. So um, this, is, this is a, um, a series. Uh, commemorating the 50th anniversary of Q's. We had two events earlier in the year, and um, this is the third event. And the fourth event, we'll, 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 we're still uh, trying to lock in the date, but we're gonna have more of a social networking event in downtown West Palm Beach in mid-December. So we'll definitely get the word out about that. The idea is that uh, at that event, we'll have an open mic, and folks can kind of be able to talk about uh, their fond memories of, of Q's and what it has meant to them in their careers. But um, before I introduce our new dean, Valerie Forbes, I just want to uh, point out a few housekeeping items. Um, uh, if you are, would like to uh, come to lunch with us, we're going to be going to Fogo de Chao. Um, please, I think probably you've all checked in um, and, and been asked whether you'd like to join us or not. We hope you can join us. Um, lunch is... Um, uh, unfortunately, we don't have a sponsorship for lunch, so um, it is on your own, but it's an uh, affordable buffet, and it's literally less than a block away. Uh, the bathrooms are outside right over here, 
Uh, and um, if you are a member of the um, American Institute of Certified Planners, don't forget that this event is eligible for 1.5 CM credits. So uh, I'm going to introduce Valerie Forbes, who's going to talk about um, our, our college, College of Science, and um, a little bit about her future vision. And then when she's done, I will introduce our keynote speaker, Reed Ewing, followed by our panel with uh, former Q's director, Jim Murley, and longtime Q's affiliate, uh, Susan Kokenauer. So, uh, Valerie. All right, thanks, John. Welcome, everybody, to the Q's 50th anniversary series lecture with Dr. Reed Ewing. Uh, and as John said, I'm Valerie Forbes, and I am the new dean of the Charles E. Schmidt College of Science. Uh, I started my role as dean here exactly two months ago today, so I'm still pretty shiny and new. Um, and I'm excited. This is my first time to the Fort Lauderdale campus, so I'm also very excited to be here as part of this uh, Q series celebrating the 50th anniversary. 50 years that have been dedicated to helping communities and decision makers plan for urban and environmental issues. Um, as John mentioned, this is the third event the center has hosted this year. The first was a webinar with Q's alumnus, Clarence Anthony, who's CEO of the National League of Cities, and he spoke about the future of smart cities. And next, the center hosted a research showcase for ABACOA projects funded by the MacArthur Foundation. And this included a, a number of timely studies, such as COVID-19 disaster readiness for older adults in Southeast Florida, and discussions on how South Florida's property values are impacted by sea level rise, both critical topics of both local and national importance. Um, as John mentioned, the center is capping off its 50th celebrations with a social networking event in December in West Palm Beach, so stay tuned for more details about that. Um, while all of these events celebrate the history of the center, uh, I want to share some of what the future looks like for Q's and the College of Science. So researchers from the college, including Dr. John Rennie and Q's, are part of the leadership team for FAU's new 26 million NSF Research Center for Smart Streetscapes. This initiative builds on the college's strengths in data science and AI. And our scientists will take part in emerging work with innovative smart city technologies that help improve the quality of life, enhance social equity, and stimulate economic development. The Schmidt College of Science is on the front lines of solving multiple complex and societally relevant problems. Part of this involves what happens to be our strategic location. We're in the most populated metropolitan area of the state, which also includes low-lying urban landscapes, the Everglades, and the Atlantic Ocean. This ideally positions us to use the powerful tools of science to address the challenges we face due to sea level rise, deteriorating water quality, climate change impacts on our ecosystems, just to name a few. Our college is uniquely positioned to facilitate multidisciplinary studies required to solve society's most challenging problems. We're home to diverse educational and research programs in eight academic departments and multiple cross-departmental graduate programs and research centers of excellence spread across three campuses. <coughs> and the strengths of our diverse academic offerings is second only to the diversity of FAU students. We are the most diverse public university in the state of Florida. We're a federally designated Hispanic serving institution, and we rank among the nation's best for Hispanics and African Americans earning their bachelor's degrees. And I'm very proud to say that the College of Science has the most diverse population of students across all colleges at FAU. And the reason I stress this is because we're producing the kind of diverse and inclusive next generation of scientists, policymakers, and leaders who will be key in shaping our future cities and ensuring that our communities are both sustainable and equitable. I wanna take a moment to thank the Q's team for continuing to lead this center with such impactful research that resonates through local and national communities and for engaging with the public, 
fellow scientists and students through the events they are hosting this year. I'm looking forward to the Q's 50th capstone event in December, and I hope all of you will join us. So I'm sure we're all eager to hear from Dr. Reed Ewing, so I will pass off the mic to John to introduce him. Thank you. Thank you, Dean Forbes. Um, so I, um, <clears throat> I've known Reed for about 20 years. I was telling him the story this morning that um, I was uh, between, after I finished my master's and before I um, was uh, uh, um, applying for doctoral programs, uh, I, had, I had gotten accepted to Rutgers University, and I was living in Perth, Australia, working with uh, a colleague uh, named Peter Newman back in um, the spring of 2001. And Peter Newman told me that if, if I'm going to do a PhD um, with anybody that, that was not him, <laughs> and I didn't want to do my PhD in Australia because I, I knew it was hard to get an academic job in the United States with an Australian PhD. He said, There's the, the, most, the, the person you have to do your PhD with is, is Reed Ewing. And so um, I got accepted to his program, but I didn't have any funding. Uh, they didn't send me a, a package. So it was about 11 o'clock at night in Perth, and I, I called, and I called Reed's office, and he just so happened to answer the phone. And I said, um, hi, Professor Ewing, my name's John Rennie. Um, I've been accepted into your program, but I've been waiting to find out if there's any financial assistance, and I don't think I could do a PhD without any financial assistance. So we spoke for about 20 minutes, and um, he, 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 uh, he, he grilled me on my knowledge of statistics. <laughs> and and, and I, I went to bed uh, after that call, and I woke up, because uh, it was about lunchtime in New Jersey at the time, I woke up, and I checked my email first thing in the morning. At the top of my inbox was a full offer for a graduate assistantship at Rutgers University. So, um, you know, Reed has, has been... That, that's just one example of the many wonderful things Reed has done for my career. He has been a tremendous mentor to me. We've, we've researched together, we've published together, uh, but most importantly, um, we're, we're good friends. And um, I, I'm not going to read off his long bio, but I'm just going to mention that, you know, Reed uh, was here, you know, doing research at the Joint Center. And during his time, he wrote a book called Best Development Practices, which is the topic of his, of his lecture here. And that book was picked in 2009 to commemorate the 100th anniversary of, of the urban planning movement by the American Planning Association as the top 100 most influential books in urban planning. So I thought it was fitting to commemorate you know, the 50th anniversary to discuss one of the top 100 most influential books that was written at the Joint Center at the time. Um, of course, Reed is, um, I think, the top three most cited urban planning scholars. He lives in Salt Lake City. He's a distinguished professor at the University of Utah, teaches urban planning. He has many advisory roles with the city, uh, and he's worked with, you know, esteemed organizations at the forefront of advocacy over the years, like Smart Growth America, the Urban Land Institute. He's written a number of influential books, um, articles. Um, so without further ado, I, I look forward to inviting Reed Ewing to give us his lecture. Well, uh, thank, thank you, uh, John, uh, for inviting me and in, in that nice uh, introduction. Uh, one of the best moves I ever made was <laughs> bringing him to Rutgers. And um, we have become good friends, and we're going to become tennis uh, partners this afternoon. So broad, and then we're going to be skiing partners. He's going to come out. He's promised. Now, he's promised this before, but he's, you know, he was a world-class skier in his youth, and I am not a world-class skier, so we're going to be on the, on the Blue Hills uh, with me uh, and him guiding me down. Uh, yeah, I uh, was in the building across the street, which uh, has been torn down, uh, and Sarah Farrell was my first research assistant, Sarah. And it was a really nice place to work. Uh, John DeGrove was um, still, uh, toward the end of his career, 
Um, uh, John was somewhat diminished, but uh, at the time I came, he was the father of growth management in the United States. And uh, I contacted him and said I wanted to, to work with him. And he, I, I would bring my own funding. And he said yes. And so we moved here to South Florida and uh, lived in Lighthouse Point as our kids were growing up. And I was working, I think it was on the sixth floor. Did I get that right? Yeah, say, with Sarah and a bunch of really, really nice people. And I'd, I'd come out of politics uh, in Arizona and the people weren't really, really nice. <laughs> so it was a, an absolute pleasure to, to move here. And um, I'm going to, uh, take you through best development practices, the uh, history of it, and uh, some of the practices that uh, uh, exemplify the book. And uh, the history is interesting. Um, that's the book. Uh, it is militantly anti-sprawl. That was the starting point. And I'll explain that in just a second. Um, DCA, and uh, there was a guy named Ben Sterrett, whom a lot of you probably have run into, uh, who was the point man for this. And uh, they were having developers, this was early growth management, they were having developers come in and say, I've just bought 4,000 acres, I'm going to build a new town. And it's going to be a place where you can live, work, play, and shop. Okay. So um, uh, give us approval for our project, DCA, or don't give us a tough time anyway. Uh, and uh, DCA was having trouble differentiating a new community, master plan community, from suburban sprawl. So uh, while I was still at USF, uh, Ben committed the funding to write best development practices to help them decide whether development, this 4,000 acre development was sprawl or a uh, new town. New town is uh, another uh, term that's used to describe these large um, places where you can uh, work and you can live and you can walk to work and you can walk to shopping and so on. So um, <clears throat> The um, DCA needed, needed criteria, and we produced the book with uh, 43 uh, criteria, which I'll tell you about in just a second. I'm, I've been told I have 40 minutes, so I'm going to try and stay within that. <laughs> so uh, there were market reasons why development was changing, changing demographics, aging baby boomers, um, uh, at that at that point, um, we we hadn't seen the Gen X and Gen Y and Gen Z, but demographics were changing. Household sizes were getting smaller, uh, which has implications for development. Um, there was a desire, which you do not get much of in sprawl, for more neighbor neighborliness. Um, and more sense of community than the typical sprawling sub 40 acre sprawling subdivision, a growing frustration with congestion and growing interest in health and fitness. We had just put out the first book, our first article, and which ultimately became a book uh, on sprawl and how it is related to lack of physical activity, uh, obesity, hypertension, a coronary heart disease, and we had found statistically that all these effects of sprawl were, uh, uh, could be modeled and, and validated. Um, so market reasons, these are market reasons why best development practices was written. Again, the main purpose, and the reason DCA provided funding is to help them in their regulatory role. Uh, the book was militantly anti-sprawl. It was also militantly non-doctrinaire. 
Uh, this was the beginning of the new urbanism. Uh, I think the Congress for the New Urbanism was uh, founded in something like 1991, and, um, and there was a lot of interest in producing a guide to the new urbanism. And maybe that would have been a better thing to do, but um, even, even now, new urbanism is, is uh, still, uh, it's an important, but it's a small part of all the development that uh, goes on in the United States. So we weren't going to write off everything that wasn't new urbanist uh, and write a book for that, but rather a book that would apply uh, uh, to all master-planned communities. And master-planned communities, you might say, well, you know, why master-planned communities? These large, uh, mostly suburban communities, why didn't you focus on downtown redevelopment? Uh, we could have. That wasn't what our client wanted. Our client wanted to be able to distinguish the good proposals from the not so good proposals uh, when they came before DCA. So contemporary versus traditional development, uh, as in the new urbanism, uh, land use is separated and buffered in uh, conventional or contemporary development. Land use is mixed seamlessly uh, in uh, traditional development. Uh, and I'll talk more about that. Wide streets, narrow streets, buildings set back from the street, buildings at the street. Formal public spaces were so important in new urbanist projects versus natural open spaces. That's a, an obvious place where you can have both. You don't have to choose one or the other. You can have the, the parks and the uh, plazas and so on, as well as natural open space. Um, so these are some of the differences. And what we weren't willing to do is just adopt the ones on the right. And I'll explain that in just a second. So uh, it isn't very often, and in fact, until last night, I hadn't realized it. I wrote a retrospective on uh, the book, Best Development Practices, in about 2000. In fact, I think it was exactly November 2000. And what I wrote in this, this is in Planning Magazine, which a lot of you probably get. I imagine many of you are planners. Uh, and I said, 20 years from now, the built environment in the typical metropolitan area will look different, not dramatically different, but different nonetheless. Population will change, individual and collective tastes will change, and housing markets will segment into more and more niches. Builders will respond in their usual cautious or conservative way, and then I went on with that. And what I was really arguing for was hybrid development, where there's a choice. So uh, this will make more sense in just a second, but uh, as opposed to buying into one favored type of development, provide choices. So that was not a whole lot uh, long, longer than, uh, uh, or farther back uh, than the, mega, the book Megatrends, uh, which, uh, quoting here, in a relatively short time, the unified mass society has fractionalized into many diverse groups of people with a wide array of different tastes and values, what advertisers call a market-segmented, markets-decentralized society. Um, and that's one of the uh, trends that uh, Nesbitt had, uh, had uh, predicted, uh, fractionalization of society. And, and I remember his, his example was um, the telephone. At one time, uh, and I can remember back this far, I'm old enough, <coughs> telephones were black, they had rotary dials, they had hell, handheld uh, receivers, uh, and that was your phone. And if you think, uh, when he wrote this in 82, phone, phones had started coming out in different colors, 
some of them were on the wall rather than on the table and so on. So he sang the telephone. Uh, it had uh, evolved into uh, multiple uh, design features and you could take your pick and if you take the telephone today, we all have with us smartphones and uh, how different manufacturers, different uh, looks, uh, different capabilities, but how uh, market decentralized phones have become. Well, I took the same idea and said communities and neighborhoods should be uh, market segmented. So um, this is from, I, I, in my original presentation in, in around 2000, I had a different comparison than this, but community A versus community B, the National Association of Realtors does this survey every so often, about every two years, and says, which would you choose if you were given the option of community A with only single family houses on large lots, no sidewalks, have to drive everywhere, uh, ample parking and no transit, or B, mix of housing types, including uh, apartments, uh, almost all the streets have sidewalks. Uh, the closest store is a, a, a walk away. Uh, parking it may, it may be limited and you have public transportation. So do you want A or B? And what do you think most people in the United States want? They don't necessarily have this choice in their uh, regional market, but anyone want to guess? Yeah, B, it was B, uh, it was B, not by a lot though, and th that is important, 56%. This was a 2011 survey. They've since done the survey in 2017, 2015, and so on, and the trend is, is, is toward, toward B. People are increasingly wanting to live in village-like, walkable, uh, tree-lined, uh, bikeable uh, villages uh, or neighborhoods, actually. Um, and that, that's not what we're building. So it's taking a while for the, we're, we're building a lot of it, but not nearly as much as you'd expect given these numbers. Um, so um, we, we want to, we're not writing off single family detached neighborhoods. Uh, there, there will be those. Uh, there is in Arlington, Virginia. If you look at the aerial imagery, you see the development around the met metro stations in Arlington and then single family off from that. But we, we said there'd be hybridization at four levels. And one would be the community level. Uh, does anyone recognize this? It's, a, it's not a very good photo, um, but it's Reston Town Center, which is very urban or traditional in its design, and it is right next to this uh, suburban uh, neighborhood uh, development. Uh, these two are only a few blocks apart. So I, I said communities in my article in Planning Magazine, communities would be like this. There would be single family neighborhoods that are on curvy streets, maybe even with cul-de-sacs, uh, but there will also be centers, town centers, village centers, that are um, uh, much more urban, gridded streets, for example, uh, and much denser and so on than what's around them. So that was, uh, that, that has happened. Uh, this is the Woodlands. If you know that development, it is, um, Woodlands is uh, in North Houston. It's a very interesting uh, new community, new, new town. Uh, and they were starting to see applications for neighborhoods like this, uh, with the village neighborhood center, excuse me, and with some more street connectivity, 
and there's still some cul-de-sacs, but uh, it, it certainly wasn't the traditional or the conventional neighborhood of the woodlands. So, so in terms of communities and neighborhoods, we're seeing hybridization. This is what that neighborhood looks like. It kind of looks uh, more wooded than most uh, uh, traditional communities, but, but still uh, doesn't look like suburban sprawl. Um, hybridization of commercial centers. I said that was going to happen. This is um, something that uh, those of you who spend time in Orlando may remember. Uh, the conversion of Winter Park Mall into Winter Park Village. Uh, there was a Dillard's uh, at one end of the mall, and it was, there was another anchor at the other end of the mall, uh, and this went away. Uh, this shot shows what was the main concourse through the mall and how they blocked it off on the right side and started building a walkable uh, neighborhood on the left side uh, with new streets and human scale and all of the things the old enclosed mall did not have. Uh, and this is what it looks like now. It, I, I said artificial, auto-oriented, and standoffish, meaning it ignores its, what, what's around it, its neighbors. Um, and uh, I would agree with those criticisms, but people love it. And Winter Park Village, last I haven't been there for probably eight years. Last time I was there, and I was going frequently, uh, and I do that to see developments I've written about um, and uh, it was thriving. Uh, people love it. So movie theater is, a, is one anchor, lots of nice restaurants, uh, clothing stores uh, where I bought a few of these, uh, and um, uh, housing. Uh, yeah, it's, not, it's not your shopping center. It's, it has a housing component. Um, and these are lifestyle centers. That's the term we now give these developments, lifestyle centers. And they're all over the place, all around the country, um, often replacing old uh, enclosed malls with a sea of parking around them. Uh, so this is, uh, this is an example of hybridization and the Winter Park's wow factor is uh, the Winter Park Village. And um, I've spent a lot of time in this village, and it is, is nice. It's, is it authentic urbanism in the sense of you know, downtown Boulder with Pearl Street? Uh, no, it's not. But it's nice, and people like it. And it is walkable. And you go there, and you buy a shirt or a sports coat, and then you go out for dinner, and then you go to a movie, and maybe you go to one of the jewelry stores, buy something, uh, and maybe you live there. That's a big change. So hybridization of neighborhoods. Uh, this is New Albany, which is kind of quasi-new urbanist, but notice there's a cul-de-sac. Um, so it's, it was, was touted as new urbanism. It really wasn't, but it wasn't totally different from the new urbanist agenda. This is Middleton Hills in Madison. Oh, by the way, uh, New Albany's in, in, uh, in Columbus. Um, this is in Madison, Wisconsin, Middleton Hills. And you may see there on the left-hand side, driveways. Well, the new urbanist model wanted housing to be alley loaded, not driveway loaded. So there, it's a hybrid. It's not perfectly new urbanist, but it's walkable and it's nice and it's successful. And one of the uh, things I didn't mention and should have is there's a subtitle to the book. Did anyone pick up on that? Best Development Practices, subtitle, doing the right thing and making money at the same time. 
Um, these developments, these hybrid developments, like the Woodlands, uh, which now has this wonderful city center, and like Middleton Hills, are very, very successful. People want what they're selling. Um, so um, this is just one example of neighborhood that's sort of a hybrid. And then individual de design features or elements are also hybridized. And this will end my talk. Um, but uh, best practices had 43 best practices in it in uh, uh, this order. Best land use practices, there were 11. Best transportation practices, there were 12. 12 best environmental practices and eight best housing practices. That's, that's the book. I should have brought a copy of the book to pass around. Um, if you really want a copy and promise to read it, oh, my, my prayers were answered. <laughs> yes, yeah. So um, uh, this is what it looks like, and you may recognize some of the uh, some of the uh, images on the cover. Uh, they're all from Florida. Miami, Lake Seal Plantation, uh, Palmer Ranch, etc. I featured. Um, five. Thank you very much for bringing this. I, I feature it, and I, I would be happy to sign it. Do you want me to? So there are all these best practices, and I can only illustrate a couple of them, but it goes back to this idea of hybrid development. So the best housing practice two of the eight or 12 or whatever there were in housing was to achieve a, an average net residential density of six to seven units per acre in the suburbs. So this was not downtown, downtown redevelopment. Remember the uh, genesis of this was DCA wanting to distinguish uh, sprawl from uh, master plan development communities or new towns. Um, six to seven units per acre was about double what uh, typical suburban uh, subdivisions at that time were, were coming in at. And uh, densities have rose, arisen in these subdivisions across the country. Uh, now, I was saying six to seven units per acre while Jane Jacobs was saying 100 units per acre. And Peter Kelthorpe, 10 to 15 units per acre. And Kevin Lynch, 12 to 20. Um, but they were talking about more, more urban places uh, than I was. I was talking about the suburbs and how to build a good suburb, walkable suburb. Uh, and what we would get out of that are more neighborly interactions and we would get, uh, as we later learned, uh, more physical activity, um, which uh, deals with the crisis we have in the area of of uh, obesity uh, and uh, all sorts of other benefits, faster response times and uh, uh, know your neighbor type neighborliness and so on. So, but the main, main impact is on travel. So uh, if we want to reduce VMT, which we do because VMT leads to climate change or adds to climate change. Uh, each mile you drove to get here, uh, you produced about a pound of CO2 every mile you drive. It's a little less than that now, but when, we wrote the, when I wrote the book, uh, Growing Cooler, it was about 20 uh, miles to, gallon, to the gallon, and uh, each, each uh, mile you, you drove uh, produced about a pound of CO2. So reduce CO2, increase walking, uh, and uh, make people healthier and happier at the same time, and so on, going along with density. And here are the, um, the uh, developments I have focused on in, in this talk over the last uh, 25 years. 
One is Rancho Santa Margarita, which is shown there, and it's a mix of sing small, uh, small single family detached. Uh, and notice it's alley loaded. The um, uh, front of the buildings are focusing open space. And then in multifamily on the lower right, and they average 12 units per acre. So they meet the, uh, the goal of best development practices. This is Southern Village, and uh, oh, by the way, that's Orange County, California, uh, Rancho Santa Margarita. Um, this one right, right here, Rancho Santa Margarita, 12 units per, eight, and per net acre, by the way. That's not per gross acre. Um, nine units per acre, Southern Village, uh, south of Chapel Hill. Well, how do they get nine units per acre? Well, they have accessory dwelling units, and they have so, uh, quite a few apartments, and they've got single-family attached housing, townhouses, in other words. Um, and they're a big seller. And Rancho Santa Margarita is a big seller. So they're making money at the same time they're doing the right thing. Baldwin Park, some of you probably have seen. I, I imagine Jim and, uh, has, has seen Baldwin Park. Uh, I really love it. Uh, who else has seen Baldwin Park? You do. You've, you, you, oh, you did. I was gonna say, yeah, n nice. Wonderful. Um, and it's 13 units per acre. Uh, and notice uh, in the, the plat, uh, you've got small lot single, large lot single, townhouse, et cetera, uh, uh, the whole housing uh, variety, and um, 13 units per acre. And this is the shocker suburb. Who knows what this is? It's Portland, yes. It's called Orenco Station. And it's in Hillsboro, which is a suburb of Portland. And they achieved 32 units per acre with mixed use development and patio homes and so on. You can see in the lower right, uh, it, there's their apartment buildings with ground floor retail. And uh, there are single family attached products as well. Best land use practice three, mixed land use is the finest grain the market will bear and include civic uses in the mix. So this is Apalachicola, and if you go to Apalachicola, you see great variation at the block level in that cross crosshatch uh, pattern, uh, which is different from block to block, shows just how much mixing there is of housing types and commercial. Uh, that's the traditional fine grain land use mix we associate with small towns. So you end up with a little house across from a supermarket. Uh, so if you live in that little house, you don't have to drive to the supermarket. What happened over time is in the 50s, 60s, 70s, and even 80s, the grain of development got bigger and bigger. Like the Aliso Viejo, that whole red area is huge. All of Apalachicola would fit in that one commercial area, the, the red area. All of Apalachicola with its hundreds of grains, if you will, um, uh, fine grained mix would fit in the red area. So it got bigger and bigger. And people were saying, well, let's go back to the corner store. And I visited all these places. I went all over the country and took photos. And, and I, I'm not convinced that at the densities you find in new communities, you can support a corner store. But you can certainly support a village or a neighborhood center. Uh, lower right, you all know. Maybe not all of you, but a lot of you know. It's downtown, what, Celebration. Uh, Hale Plantation, middle, and uh, Southern Village, upper left. And these are all viable commercial centers as part of the, uh, their mixed-use communities. 
And then the last one is best transportation practice one, design the street network with multiple connections in relatively direct routes. And um, this is Apalachicola again, and you can see it has a traditional grid pattern and it has a connectivity index of 1.69. And one of the things I haven't talked about was best development practices has been implemented a lot of places. Um, and the most implemented portion is this. You, you take, count the number of links, you count the number of nodes or intersections, cul-de-sac heads, you divide one by the other, and you get a number of 1.69 uh, for a traditional town like Apalachicola. Now this is Hale Plantation town center or village center, but all those cul-de-sacs and disconnected roads uh, lead to an index of 1.19. We advocated 1.40 in the, in the book, which is about Miami Lakes uh, level of connectivity. Um, it's coming in even higher than that, in many of these new urbanist communities, 1.6, 1.5. This is from Peter Calthorpe. Uh, his idea of a uh, hybrid network. Peter Calthorpe, if you don't know, is one of the founders of the Congress for the New Urbanism. He's an architect in the Bay Area. Um, so what it isn't is a perfect grid, but it has a lot of connectivity. So how to implement best practices this is my last two minutes. Um, uh, Orlando Southeast Sector Plan is an example. Uh, Calthorpe was brought in to do a plan for the area of Lake Nona, which is, as you fly into Orlando, is just south and mostly east of the airport. Uh, Calthorpe uh, was brought in. The city split the cost with the landowners, and he came up with this plan. And the, the kind of brownish or reddish uh, areas are village centers and neighborhood centers. Um, and uh, the developers, the landowners, weren't entirely comfortable, so they hired a local planner who came up with a very similar plan. Very similar plan. So final consensus plan right there. Again, the cost was split between the landowners and the city of Orlando. And they envisioned a traditional design standards uh, t for the town center, neighborhood centers, and residential centers. Uh, and traditional design standards being optional for village centers, residential neighborhoods, and public uses. So you could build one way or you could build the other. Hybrid. You could have one neighborhood that was new urbanist, in one neighborhood that was conventional. Um, what you got if you did the traditional development uh, is higher densities and intensities, fee waivers, expedited permitting, narrower streets, and lower transportation impact fees. So there was a financial incentive to build uh, the traditional neighborhood, but it wasn't mandated. And guess what development form uh, is most common in Lake Nona? Well, the last time I checked, it was split, so, uh, hybrid. So if I said the word hybrid 50 times, I'm happy. Uh, so guess what form it's taken? Well, uh, the original Lake Nona is shown at the southern end of this uh, it's a golf course community. You may know it if you follow golf, that a lot of famous golf professional golfers live there. And then what appears to be very different development at the northern end, it's North Lake uh, Village or neighborhood, uh, with, it's, it's a, obviously not a grid, but it's got lots and lots of connections. And I would guess that the connectivity index is 1.6 or 7 or 8 something like that, not 1.8, but 1.6. Um, 
So putting uh, best development practices into its proper perspective, this is the end. Uh, so I, what I've tried to do is, is give you a balanced view of the, of the book and what it was trying to accomplish with um, John DeGrove and with uh, Ben Sterrett and I forget who the uh, uh, director of DCA was at that time. But to put it in as, who was it? Yeah, yeah, I think you're right. Um, so to put it in its pr proper perspective, I'm going to read a letter to you. I'm going to read a letter to you that was written by my second daughter. I've got three daughters and one son, and one daughter disappeared after high school uh, in her old beat-up car and went headed, headed east or west uh, to California or Washington or, or Oregon, and we weren't sure where. So she wrote us uh, months later, Dear Mom and Dad, I'm sorry I haven't written sooner, but all of my stationary was lost, stationary area, stationary was lost the night the dorm was burned down by demonstrators. I'm out of the hospital now. The, the doctor says my eyesight may return to normal someday and the skin grafts won't show much. The wonderful boy, Bill, who rescued me from the fire, kindly offered to share his apartment with me until I found a new place of my own. You always wanted a grandchild, so you'll be glad to know that you will be grandparents next month. Love, Alicia. And then a PS. PS, please disregard the above exercise in creative writing. There was no fire. I haven't been in the hospital. I didn't get pregnant. In fact, I don't even have a boyfriend. But I did get a D in French and an F in math, and I wanted to be sure that you would receive this news in its proper perspective. <laughs> so that, that was probably more than 40 minutes, but now we're ready for the panel. So I'd like to invite uh, Jim Murley and Susan Kokenauer up front, and I'll just uh, briefly introduce them, but I'd like for them to have about five minutes each to reflect um, you know, on their time with Q's. Um, Jim Murley was the director of Q's uh, from about 2001 to 2011, is that right? Yeah. Um, and he is, he's now the Chief Resilience Officer with Miami-Dade County. And so um, Jim is at the forefront of, of this challenging uh, debate about, you know, how do we make our, our communities more resilient to climate change? And um, Susan Kokenauer has, has, um, is, is, is our most uh, important booster alumni. Um, she is always there to help us. Um, she, she, you were in, in you, you studied at FAU in the 1970s. You were one of the first classes. I was yes. Well, I was John's first graduate assistant. John DeGroe's first when graduate he assistant. The joint center. Yeah. Um, and she's now retired, but very, very actively engaged with the American Planning Association. Um, with, with our department and, and, and uh, center, and um, uh, we're, we're always um, grateful to her uh, for, for her efforts. Um, and um, I, I would like to ask uh, uh, Jim to start, maybe reflecting on, um, the first, and then we'll open it up for Q&A to the, the, the group. But um, what, what I'm curious about is, you know, in the history of kind of the last 50 years of South Florida development, there has been this emphasis on managing suburban sprawl, basically. Um, but now, you know, we're kind of faced with not only that challenge, but with this whole issue of resilience. Um, but yeah, I, I would love for you to reflect a little bit about, about your time with Q's and see if you could kind of transition to that in terms of your current role. Thanks, John. And. Um, you know, first of all, it's just wonderful to know that there still is a Q's. Yes. <laughs> that was in question for a while. But uh, under your leadership, and I'm sure your support from the new dean, uh, I, I'm thrilled. 
and uh, there's a long history, uh, and a lot of people in this room, now that I turn around and look out, uh, can uh, contribute to that. Um, so, you know, my first job uh, where I met John DeGrove was 1974 when I left planning in law school and came here to work for the South Florida Regional Planning Council. So uh, I moved around since, ended up back, uh, and it's, it's clear, you know, a lot of what Reed said about what are the styles that can be moved from um, theory and academia to the marketplace where, you, where people are making money. And I would, I would additionally say that how can that happen where government can find ways to participate in that? And I think that John DeGrove, who was my mentor for sure, both at the department and here, had, a, uh, had both of those in mind. And so on one hand, we would be actively looking for ways to fund, say, affordable housing. You couldn't just write a plan and order people to build affordable housing. You had to evolve to a place where we have what we now call the Sadowski Act, where government participates in that in order to incentivize that outcome. I, th I think on the natural side, which we were always trying to balance, John and, and his partner uh, uh, in the 1,000 Friends um, always tried to, you know, again, we were trying to protect the environment, we were trying to encourage cities and counties to build their plans and regulations to do that, but that wasn't going to be sufficient. So we needed an aggressive land acquisition program that became, went under many names, uh, but still is active. And I think the last thing I would add, and it's fresh in my mind, I'm sure all of us, because we're, we're feeling for our neighbors in the Southwest. When we, in, 19, in the mid-1980s, when we decided that uh, it was under uh, Governor Graham. John was secretary. Many of us were participating either at the department. I was just the director of planning at the time. And Ben Starrett was there, Reed. Uh, and many other people um, in the, uh, were out advising and, and promoting. We were facing uh, coastal development trends that, you know, were exasperated by long-range um, deterioration of the coast, but impacts of hurricanes. And, you know, out of these events that, that Florida has experienced have come long-range trends that change the way we approached land development. And John was always aware of those. The center would always focus on that. Um, certainly the one we all think about is the building codes coming out of Andrew. But I... But none of, at that time, when we did all that work in the mid-'80s, even into the 2000s, the word climate change was not on the agenda. It wasn't, an, and sea level rise was not there. So now that all that we've learned has to be sort of repositioned, I believe, some of what we do at, at our center, Office of Resilience. And Offices of Resilience, by the way, in Broward, Palm Beach, Monroe, there's a state <coughs> chief resilience officer. There's federal legislation pending to create a Office of Resilience and a CRO in the White House. So it has kind of evolved, uh, I believe, along the same um, spectrum from growth management into the, dealing with these issues because we recognize that with climate change, we can't extrapolate the past. We have to be prepared to model and use science, since it's great that you're in the College of Science, to understand how to develop for the future. And uh, I think it's, it's great that, the, that this program is here to do that and appreciate the opportunity to join the panel. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. And, and Susan has had, had a very long career with the South Florida uh, Water Management District, so you know all about <laughs> flood yeah. control. Well, the interesting thing, just as an aside, at the Water Management District, uh, because of all the control structures that are located along the canals, we've been dealing with the concept of climate change and sea level rise. Back in the 80s and 90s, <coughs> there was always the concern about the saltwater, freshwater interface and the impacts on, you know, future revisions to those structures and things. So even when you weren't allowed to say the word climate change or sea level rise uh, for several years in the state, um, 
for many years, uh, the Water Management District always dealt with that issue in many different ways. Uh, but I want to go back and talk a little bit about the very beginning of the district of the uh, the Q's of, uh, organization. Um, the thing that there's, there's several things about it that I remember back then. I was just a graduate student then, and um, and and John gave me a graduate assistantship, which is what allowed me to uh, come back and go to graduate school. And he'd actually recruited me when I was still, um, as an undergraduate, we were in line behind each other in the cafeteria. He knew how active I had been in student government and on the university curriculum committee. And he said, you know, you really should come back to FAU and do the public administration program. That was the precursor to all the programs that have, have uh, occurred since then. Well, I kept that in my mind, and when I was ready to do that a year later, I came back. And the program was housed both in the College of Social Science, when John was the dean of the college at that time, and also over in the College of Business and Public Administration. And uh, so I went to John, and I went to Don Clare. I don't know if anybody here still remembers who he was. And I said, okay, which one of you can give me a graduate assistantship? And if, if you can come up with the money, that's the program I'll enroll in. Well, John had the money. And what was unique when he started this jo joint center, the contacts that he have had with legislators, with political leaders in the state, with business leaders in the state, uh, with the legislature and, and everyone else, he had his own line item budget for the joint center which was incredibly unique. And, and it was a nice, hefty amount of money at that time. And that allowed him to create this center and just hit the road running. He, uh, Kathy Abrams was the assistant director. He had gained, brought in staff. Uh, that's when Lance DeHaven Smith first came, Jim Nicholas first came. Um, and he created this... Um, interdisciplinary organization uh, at, that was Q's back then. He drafted a lot of us as graduate assistants. He modeled a lot of um, uh, 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 workshops using the American assembly process that had been developed by Di Dwight Eisenhower when he was the president of Columbia University. And and then he also lent out the staff to local governments. You know, we would go and sit with one of the local cities and try and help them work out what process they were going to use to develop their comp plan if they'd never had a comp plan before. But I, I think the thing that's most significant about that was just, you know, his ability to interact with so many different people at so many different levels and and even though he was uh, a university professor, in quotes, uh, he also had the kind of uh, business connections um, to fund a lot of these. Um, he he had an amazing source of uh, community donors that helped to underwrite many of the activities that were done, and really really set. I think the stage for a lot of things that came. Uh, I had there's some there's some little sayings I, I I developed this one time before that I used, but there's to me the legacy of John is one one person can always make a difference, and and it, I think he was really ex an example of that. Um, another point theory can always successfully. Uh, make it uh, be translated into practice. You know, he, he was never just talking about theory. It was how do you translate it into practice. Uh, one thing that I always remembered that he said about me and others, and, and I think he exemplified this, you can always catch a lot more flies with honey than with vinegar. There, there's a style to way, the way you interact with people. Uh, never give up 
uh, when you run into an obstacle, try a different approach. So just come at it in a different way. And lastly, keep your eye on the big picture and don't get lost in the weeds. Um, so, and I, and I think that carried through his entire career at the Water Management District. Yeah. I'm sorry. He also served on the Water Management District Board, I should yeah. say. Um, but all through cues, I think. Yeah. So I'm just one, um, I love the history, but it, it might be interesting for folks to know the original uh, item, it's, it's actually been written, the rumor, the urban rumor was, was written on a napkin yes. uh, by, oh, by, and, and. by John and, uh, and uh, Bob Graham, who was then right. a state senator to become governor. Um, there was no state university in Southeast Florida. Mm -hmm. uh, and the University of South Florida had been created in Tampa, which really <laughs> irritated John and, and the governor. Uh, so they, so FAU was the first uh, state university to be created at, at an airfield in Boca Raton. And then FIU came. And DeGrove and the governor didn't like that. They wanted one large state university in Southeast Florida, but they kept losing. So they created the joint center at FAU and FIU for environmental and urban problems. Mm -hmm. that, was the, that was the official center. As things emerged over time, um, the FIU piece is now the Perez Metropolitan Center doing great. Mm -hmm. And at some point we decided that urban, we, we repositioned this as the uh, Center for Urban and Environmental Solutions. Mm -hmm. That happened at the FAU piece. So it was an interesting, uh, even then, while those are just tidbits of names, the, that partnership between John DeGrove and Governor Graham yes. uh, was absolutely had an impact in Tallahassee. When, when Governor Graham was a U.S. Senator, uh, that, that was really uh, important to um, things that, that occurred uh, here in Southeast Florida. I, I like the name change. Uh, we used to kid that uh, if you don't have problems, yeah. it's the Center for Urban and Environmental Problems. Yeah. We will create them for you. <laughs> <laughs> so speaking of problems, let, let me ask the first question, and then I want to open it up to everybody. But th So if the problem facing our climate is carbon emissions, and the carbon emissions are predominantly, well, I think driving is the number one emitter of carbon emissions. Um, my question, I guess, is to challenge the, these best development practices a little bit. Like, do they go far enough, right? We, we Reed and I, and, you know, have done a lot of work on transit-oriented development, uh, which is kind of a, you know, a newer term. It's still been around for 25 years now. But are we doing enough? I mean, we, we you know, we'll probably talk a little bit you know, here in a little moment about buffering our communities to sea level rise and, and heavy winds and storm surge, right? But but the reason, you know, that a lot of these, these climate change impacts are happening is because we continue to live in a, a very unsustainable way. And so um, my question, I guess, for, for the panel, I'll let you start off, Reed, is, you know, do we really need to radically rethink the emission of carbon as we plan our communities and our transportation systems? Well, so uh, I mentioned I wrote the book, Growing Cooler, The Evidence on Urban Development and Climate Change, uh, in 2007. So it was the first major work um, on climate change by a planner. And what we found is that uh, it wasn't enough to develop in a compact way versus sprawl. Uh, the compact development produced somewhere between 20 and 40 percent less carbon or VMT, vehicle miles traveled, which translates directly into carbon, um, than suburban sprawl. So 20 to 40 percent, but we would need more than that to reach the target levels of the 80 percent reduction by 2050, that sort of thing. And uh, we would need, and we, we could, for the light duty 
truck and car market, we could get very, very close to the target level of production if we had compact development. So that's one thing, meaning basically denser. Uh, it's more than dense development, but compact. Uh, we could get that, that, and if we had a doubling of the amount of transit, and we cut highway building in half, and we increase gas prices uh, by 50%, you know, a la Europe, uh, uh, that the combination of those things, I may be missing one, would, would to get the, the blue line down to the red line. The red line was where we wanted to go to by 2050. Uh, so uh, it's, as, as I said, you know, I, I, I said 20 years hence, uh, we'll see how close I come to predicting the future. But we've got, I live in Salt Lake now, we've got the whole sugar house area with the streetcar that is developing uh, mixed use uh, buildings. Uh, we've got 400 South, we've got North Temple, uh, we've got uh, neighborhoods uh, where, where there once was industrial right next to downtown. And I think we're, we're getting there uh, slowly but TOD, Transit Oriented Development, is going to be an important part of, of getting there. Uh, so John, John and I had this conversation last night. Uh, is it enough to build a community where a lot of the trips are walk trips, but there isn't really much of a transit component like Southern Village? And walk, walking is 10 times more common than bicycling and three times more common than transit use in the United States. So a walkable community gets you a long way toward your goal. Uh, Southern Village, which I mentioned three or four times, has in the single family detached neighborhoods has 20% walk trips. In the attached, 40% walk trips. So walking is a good mode of transportation but it's even better when it's like a Renko station with light rail and walkability. Yeah, thank you. Um, Susan, you have any thoughts? Yeah, um, I, I think one of the greatest um, difficulties that we all deal with right now is all of these new communities tend to be away from the coastal areas. Um, and, and if you're trying to deal with this issue, what you're having to deal with is all, all, all of the already existing development. And in many times there's limited opportunities in those already developed areas to go back and do any kind of retrofit, which would allow you to do uh, the, these kinds of uh, transit-oriented development projects. And so, so we need to be finding ways to do more of that. Um, another big component of this, I think, is how to better educate and communicate with our elected officials and our advisory board members who advise those elected officials on planning and zoning boards, historic preservation boards, uh, abatement, you know, all of those types of things. Um, you know, plan, the APA and through APA, the state chapter and the local sections, we do some of that kind of training, but it's it's limited and it's, it's not as available as it should be. Um, I think that that is something that, you know, I would suggest that CUES and, and other institute, educational institutions try to do more of that. Because if you don't open up some of these other options more to people, they're, they're going to tend to either look at new development in terms of jobs that are provided and less about some of these other types of issues. We, we've had a lot of webinars over the last few years with COVID. Um, you know, they, we usually get over 100 
plus people at those Zoom uh, webinar events. And now this is our first kind of in-person lecture since COVID. And, you know, it's um, we had about 40 or 50 people registered. But I think it's 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 hard, you know, this whole kind of um, uh, post-COVID uh, in-person versus virtual world is hard in terms of outreach, right? Because we want to do more in-person outreach. But we, of course, we live in a, in a place where, you know, we held this in Fort Lauderdale thinking we can grab folks from Miami all the way up to, you know, uh, Jupiter and beyond. And, and of course, um, Kim is here from beyond. And, um, you know, but it, it's, it's hard. So I think outreach and engagement, which is one of the hallmarks of what Q's has always done, and we do a lot of it. Now, Serena is, does a phenomenal job um, helping me to do outreach. Um, it, it is, it's challenging. Um, but um, anyway, I don't want to keep going too far on that. Jim, what, what are your thoughts on all this? I mean, this is a topic you face on a day-to-day basis. So. Yeah, and um, it's, I think as, as local governments have faced this at times with uh, support sometimes opposition from state government and federal government that has changed but I think many of southeast Florida local governments have what are called climate action strategies and they're a combination of adaptation plans which is you know prepare for extreme heat and sea level rise and then plans to reduce greenhouse gases I would note that when I was here at uh, at Q's we were offered the first grant to do a plan, a, a report on adaptation. It was done here at the center. It grew into a statewide plan that they is administered by the Department of Environmental Protection and is, has the support of the, of the government at the, in Tallahassee. I wanted to note, though, something about what I'm learning on the, um, on the electrification of transportation and the importance of what we use every day, but need to understand further, and that's the grid. You know, because the, the grid is where you plug in the, your car to power it up overnight, or where your air conditioner uh, gets its electricity. We, uh, we, you know, because of our uh, environment, we don't use gas to heat homes as much as other places. But that whole issue of electricity, we are, we are in a transition to a more electrified uh, world and community which means more demand for electricity. So I would note, and something that I think that the university can focus on, is the recent announcement by Florida Power and Light, which surprised me, because we haven't had much success with them, that they are on a path to go to zero emissions without the phenomena of what are called trade-offs. And it, it will happen right here in Broward County because in order for that to work on paper, they have to take the existing power plants out west of here and out by the port that are, are currently uh, run on natural gas and, tra and transition them to hydrogen. And so a hydrogen economy powered by electricity off of solar grids and batteries eliminates carbon. Mm. And at that point, you know, we're in a whole different world. Good. And they they have a plan to do that, and I think if the if we as as local governments and and state and county governments and universities can leverage that, we can make huge advances. Yeah. They're the only major utility right now that's on record to do that. Now they have a lot of obstacles, yeah. but but I think it's unique that uh, it's happening here. Thanks, John. Yeah, and um, gosh, I'm just looking at time. I can't believe how <laughs> quick t uh, time has been going. I want to open it up to questions. Does anybody? Yes. Um, so in Palm Beach County. Hi. Um, in Palm Beach County, Florida, there's a lot of equestrian communities. And so in planning school and like what we're learning here about development practices, when a developer wants to build a community like nearby or within the equestrian community, it's like, okay, it's totally different. You have to factor in horses, then horses are scared of different noises. And how, how does that work? Does anyone take I, that? <laughs> <laughs> Palm Beach? You live in Palm Beach. <laughs> how does it work? Well, there we go. Let's let Raphael. No, he's, he just oh, wants to, he has a question. Oh, a question. Um, I think that those tend to be more isolated communities, the equestrians. They're, they're finite areas. It doesn't mean that you can't 
you know, create a town center, and um, and people are just going to ride their horses to the sound <laughs> center potentially. So, so we uh, we did a study of um, what's called internal capture, which is where trips start and end in the same community. Mm -hmm. We did it in South Florida, and these are not exempt. They're not best development practice communities, but 50% of the trips were internal to both, both Weston and Wellington. Mm -hmm. So if you, if you provide for bikeability, walkability, uh, and, and short auto trips, you can get rid of about half of the trips that leave a large development, even though, again, it's not, neither of those are good examples of this book. Uh, Miami Lakes is a good example of this book. Hill Plantation is a good example of this book. Uh, but uh, those two still have a 50% internal capture rate, which is terrific. Mm -hmm. And how old was your study, Josh? Of, of them, uh, probably 20 years. Okay. If you like, take a look at what Welling's been doing, you know, up through the current. I think you'll find that that's still the case, in terms. And, you know, and, and Wellington, for example, has a tremendous redevelopment opportunity with the mall. I mean, I, I, at some point, you know, I think that will be uh, a major town center, uh, very similar to some of these other examples that that we've seen. Of course, I was there. A couple months ago, and I was impressed how busy the mall was. So it's it's you know malls that are thriving um, have less of an opportunity for redevelopment, but it's when they start to deteriorate and have high vacancies where there's more of opportunity for um, you know for uh, redevelopment. But it's there's a tremendous amount of land. And there's a professor uh, Reed probably knows very well um, up in Georgia who um, focuses on redevelopment of of suburban shopping centers. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Alan, Alan Dunham Jones. Yeah. Um, and in many ways, that, that overlaps a lot with best development practices. Yeah, but uh, Raphael had his hand up for a question. Good morning, everyone, and excellent presentation. Susan, it's great to see you <laughs> as well, and, and you as Jim as well. Um, I, I have a comment and a question. And my, my comment is um, to, your, to what you said earlier, Susan, about um, how do we educate our elected leaders and and the boards that inform them. Um, I've made it one of my professional missions to take any leader by the hand and put them in the real world, put them on transit, show them what walkability is like, show them what good smart density is like, take them to places where this stuff is being done and works and people love it and it's got quality of life, you know, benefits, et cetera. Um, and I would encourage all of us to do that. Don't just give them a book. I mean, books are great, webinars are great, but take them there and show it to them. That's, that's the way they really get this stuff the best. And take them with the naysayers along with you, so then you all learn together. Um, and, and, this is a, and, my, and my question is, and it, this is not, not a new question at all, um, when we achieve walkability and um, quality uh, places, whether it's urban redevelopment or new construction um, in, in, in the ways described in your book, uh, Mr. Ewing, uh, how do we fight the affordability challenge? It's, and it's, that's, that's, that, that's an old question, but is there, is there new answers to this? Um, yeah, we've done a lot of work on housing affordability. And the problem is uh, if you put in a transit line, like our light rail lines or our streetcar line in Salt Lake, it tends to bump up land prices near the, uh, near the station, um, which makes housing less affordable than it would be otherwise. What we're, what we're finding, we've, we've looked at 85 TODs, transit oriented developments, right next to rail stations in the United States. We're finding about 20% of the units are affordable 
for low and moderate income households, which means 80% aren't. And um, you have to have developers that are willing to use the low income housing tax credit. You have to have developers that are willing uh, to uh, uh, provide affordable units under inclusionary zoning. 20% uh, isn't large enough. Um, so uh, there are, we wrote a report with 24 different tools and which jurisdictions in Utah are using them and only about half of the uh, jurisdictions are using uh, a handful of the 24 tools. So government has a role, private development has a role uh, in making sure that these TODs, which are popping up all over our, our region, have affordable housing. And one obvious thing to do is to reduce parking requirements uh, and fast track those projects. We have state transit station area zoning, which by right you can build uh, multifamily housing you know, without going through the planning commission, et cetera. So make it, make it expedited, as I said before, reduce impact fees uh, to reflect the availability of transit, uh, make sure it's mixed use, uh, and government controls zoning. And all of these things are possible under zoning ordinances. Yeah, I, I, let me just respond really quick, too, because th there is a brand new tool that the state of California just enacted, like, literally weeks or a month or two ago, um, and that is they, um, they, they banned parking requirements in all TOD areas across the entire state of California. And so if you assume that the cost to build a structured parking space is about $40,000 per space, and, and a lot of cities have been requiring a minimum of two spaces per unit or one and a half spaces per unit, um, that could potentially save forty to $80,000 of construction costs per unit. Um, and so that is potentially a huge cost savings to building housing because all that parking cost is baked in to the rents and baked into the cost of those particular units. Um, we're at the end of the time, but I want to kind of allow each panelist to say some final words. Why don't we start with Jim and kind of work our way back down towards Reed? <laughs> well, I'll start where I began. I'm so happy Q's is still here. He got the work. The university needs to support him. Um, you know, I would know. Uh, I think, Reed, you mentioned Abacoa at one point. Mm -hmm. Ab did, did you I, I didn't mention it, but I'm familiar. Yeah, with I, I'm sorry. I thought it was one of your pictures. Avacoa is connected to Q's directly because we assisted in its design. Peter Calthorpe was one of the many people that it was MacArthur property, um, and they wanted to design it in its entirety. And they also um, uh, wanted to make it walkable. You know, it's a, it's a hybrid by any means. And uh, but out of that came... Um, an endowment from the MacArthur Foundation to Q's to maintain that. And I think, John, probably you're doing some of that research. But I think that's, that's a really vital link uh, to understanding Florida development, um, the ultimate uh, impact of large land ownership in Florida that has impacted things. You may have re read recently about Babcock Ranch, uh, one of the communities that's ending up in the media. Uh, and that's worth looking at, uh, but there's that is a, a connection that I think uh, um, many universities probably won't have that you can build on, and I think that's an, uh, something I uh, look back uh, on as something I thought was very important for the center. Thanks. Thank you, Jim. Uh, um, I, I think I would reiterate much of what Jim has said. I would like to see Q's having a much more active role with a lot of the local governments, uh, more cooperative efforts with, for example, the League of Cities, um, the county associations, um, and interacting as much as possible with the many different professionals 
that are part of the piece when a, a developer is putting a community together. Um, we don't have the DRI process anymore. That was a great example. It, it taught a lot of local governments in this state how to actually review of a development and make sure that all the different components were being addressed to the benefit of the local government. And, and we've lost a lot of that, but I, I think an organization like Q's could do a lot to, uh, to help do we, we have an exciting opportunity for you and everybody in West Palm Beach coming up um, starting at the end of October and into November, uh, where we are working with the city's um, Office of Sustainability. And we've developed a very cool virtual reality model um, with the latest technologies and hyper-realistic uh, drone imagery to visualize what sea level rise impacts could happen in the northern part of West Palm Beach along the parks and with options for uh, mitigation, um, you know, to protect those communities for sea level rise. And so the whole point of that outreach effort is to invite the public to wear these VR goggles and to experience it. It is kind of a mind-blowing experience if you've never done it. Um, and so stay tuned. We'll be sending out info where we, uh, Serena and I have about 12 to 15 events on um, that will be in the community at the public library, the science center, the green market, the lagoon fest. Um, so that, that's an immediate thing that we invite you all to come and participate in. And it's not, not just for West Palm beach. This is no, this is a state grant we got from the DEO to fund resilience planning for the city of West Palm beach. But we, we are always looking for opportunities to work with other communities out there as well. We've worked with, um, uh, in the past, you know, with, with uh, Fort Lauderdale and Hollywood and whatnot. Yeah. Reed. Okay. Uh, well, um, first I'd like to thank you for uh, letting me participate in this event. This is, this is great. Uh, seeing Sarah again uh, was terrific in those years I spent at what was the problem center and now the solution center where we're, we're good years. Um, I, I'm going to um, kind of uh, zoom out from the level of the individual community to what can happen at the state level because we have two good examples. Uh, the two good examples are Oregon and California which now is part of their regional planning process, require um, MPOs within their state to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions, mm -hmm. and which means more transit, fewer roads, a lot of pressure on local governments to get away from Euclidean zoning to mixed use zoning uh, and so on. And the initial results, these two states are the only two that have them. Initial results are kind of iffy, but uh, it sets a framework that filters down to the individual locality and ultimately to the individual uh, household, a uh, framework for a uh, uh, different carbon future. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, we don't have it in Utah, you don't have it in Florida, but I think I've said this many times. I think that climate is the existential issue of our time, the existential threat, uh, and that it will become for planners the focus as the fingerprints of climate change become less and less easy to ignore. The, the droughts, the wildfires, the storms, the flash flooding, the sea level rise. The last point I'll make is even if you, um, your community only produces so much carbon and we're talking about a worldwide problem, there are co-benefits and this term co-benefit should be used a lot. Um, co-benefits to having um, a climate action planning as part of your, your planning process because People get healthier because they walk more. Uh, the uh, 
emergency response times improve, life expectancy goes up in compact developments versus sprawling ones, uh, obesity goes down, and so on and so forth. So even if climate, you know, my not driving here it only makes a tiny little dent in carbon, but there are other good reasons to, uh, to go low carbon rather than high carbon. And these co-benefits shouldn't be forgotten. Great. Well, thank you. Before we give them a round of applause, I, I want to uh, present each panelist with a little token of our appreciation. Oh, a mega hat. <laughs> <laughs> Um, this is a, a FAU visor and a latest copy of my book, Adaptation, Urbanism, and Resilient Communities, Transforming Streets to Address Climate Change. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah, Susan, thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome. Um, so um, please join us for um, lunch if you have time. It's just um, literally across the street, Foga de Chao. Um, and thank you all. I mean, we, we had hoped to have a, a larger audience, but um, it's not the size, it's the quality. So thank you all so much. <laughs>